Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu to some of you and peace to the rest of you. This is Blackheart, sign of Black in again. <clears throat> Asking you to hit that share button even before you hit the like or the subscribe button. Um, because the message is more important than the messenger has ever been. And if it wasn't so, then I wouldn't record it. In 1955, a movie was released that addressed the uh, changing attitudes of America's teenagers in a way that the previous films had not. And it was called Rebel Without a Cause. And it was some major white crap. Previous films had addressed the delinquency of teens growing up in slums, but this one addressed the rebellion of teens in middle class areas. And in this movie, James Dean's character fell for his own brother's girlfriend anyway, which was bad enough. But this movie was considered a hit and a blockbuster and uh, a culture changer. And it began the solidification of the American idea of the teenager, which was nebulous and debatable before this. Now, America, namely white America, had the idea of the teenager as neither child nor adult. The worst of both and the best of neither, exactly what a culture would need for its moral decline. We know they went through a moral decline. They complained about it. We know we went through a moral decline. So in reality, the teenager is not as experienced as people in their 20s, let alone older than that. And they don't have the financial independence of other adults yet, which is not their fault. No one in either America, black, white, or any of the third Americas blames teenagers for this. But they do have the moral reasoning capacity of adults, though. They know right from wrong as well as a 60-year-old does. They're just socialized not to care because the expectations aren't there for them to care and they know it. Before they become teens, when they're kids and preteens, they think teens are supposed to be stupid and wild and can get away with it. So when they arrive at the age of 13, they think they aren't supposed to be mature and worth a crap anyway. And this is why we see these teens bully each other until someone snaps and shoots up the schools. Their culture is not civilized but rather it's a culture of uncivilization, barbarism, which is why they went around the world and colonized it and kidnapped and enslaved everybody. This is cemented in their teenage years. Now, understand this. I said this is cemented in their teenage years. And this is when they're supposed to form their adult personalities, um, morally speaking, to later be supplemented by more experiences and wisdom and financial independence. But the moral character of their adulthood is to be formed in the teen years, not afterwards. Caring about morality is not supposed to begin in your 20s, but in the teens and early teens at that. When white America decided to excuse their teens from that under the idea that this moral dysfunction of teenagers is normal, we made a mistake. See, we followed them crackers. We excused nigger behavior in teenagers as something that came with that age when in fact there's no moral or um, there's no natural compunction for teens to be um, morally bankrupt. When a child bullies another child, you can punish the child and they'll stop later on maybe learning a lesson. But when a teenager bullies someone else and he or she is capable of having his or her own children, this person's already dangerous to other human beings. You're dealing with uh, some sort of narcissism or psychopathy. And if the if you can prove a teenager did this, you should kill them. Because they can morally understand how wrong it is and how it can damage the victim permanently. They can logically understand it as well. Now, when I say bullying, I don't mean what these kids and teens to today mean by the word bullying. I mean actually physically threatening or harming someone, not verbally only. But once you can prove a teenager did this, the best penalty is to beat such a person to death or decapitate them publicly. Whichever one you do should be done publicly so that bullying, and I mean the physical kind, is not normalized anymore, neither by teens nor the parents and other adults. You see, if a 40-year-old walked around bullying other adults and the 40-year-old got killed for doing it, nobody would bat an eye. But when a teen does this to another teen, no one thinks that the bullying teen should be killed for it. Oh, they're just teenagers. That's the mistake we made. It's not normal, but we take it like it is. Now, teenagers should be stuck with the same penalties for crimes that have victims as adults. Not liking someone is okay. But to slander someone without proof is not okay just because we're socialized to think teenagers are going to start rumors and they can't help it. No, they can help the stuff. So if your daughter 
has no mental disability and she can bleed, she can calculate how wrong it is to blame someone else for something she isn't sure they did, especially just to make herself feel better or make another girl look bad. So for her to ask if something is true isn't slander, but for her to say so without evidence or proof is same for guys. But white teens are the offspring of the ones who built the system and for whom they built it, and they are in fact the offspring of the legal system. So they're not gonna face these consequences I mentioned. And the consequences I mentioned are considered extreme right now, even when you hear me saying this, because we're socialized to think of our teens as still kids, but not for much longer. We're socialized to think as leniently of our offspring as those European races think of their own kids. But when one of our teens faces any kind of public scrutiny for normal teenage antics, especially if a victim is white, you know how outraged white parents become. They think the black teenager is no longer a kid. You've seen it before. This is an adult, actually an animal who must be punished extra harshly to show who's boss. How dare this wide-nosed, big-lipped nigga teenager act like this at the expense of someone white. I get it. Because if a white teen bullied my son, I would want that little devil dead too. The difference is I can't convince cop, jury, or judge to take it seriously. But if the scenario or even accusations are just reversed, these white parents can convince all three to make our sons and daughters pay. So we've co-opted this American idea of the teen, though this very idea was designed to let them morally retarded offspring off the hook so as to save the prison room for our teens. <coughs> And us stupid jungle bunnies bought it hook, line, and sinker and let our teens act like their stereotype of the teenager, lost, morally bankrupt, and fully expecting to get away with it, thereby setting it up for our kids to attract the scrutiny already meant only for them to begin with. Now, what are the consequences of the nigger teenage phase we allow our children to traverse artificially and unnecessarily, thinking it's necessary? The hoe is a consequence. The player whoremonger, you know, the niggas that screw the hoes, are a consequence. And a jailbird convict nigga criminal who gets a felony and then has to keep going back behind bars because he can't earn bread any other way with a conviction is also a consequence. This leads to the wannabe ex-ho who decided to change too late in life. The ex-player whoremonger who can't give marital advice because he knows too many women are still in the whole face. And a Johnny come lately pro-black ex-con who had to uck his life up royally before becoming a smart dumb nigga jailhouse philosopher and trying to save the kids with his functionally illiterate behind. And what's wrong with the ones who decide to put ex or former in front of what they used to be? Nothing except the nigga teenage phase. That's what's wrong with it. I mean, to decide to reform and repent is, not, is never wrong when you're serious about it, when you're sincere. But the nigger teenage phase will make sure that there's always something about it that haunts these niggers. See, what's in this phase that they're taught a form of ratchet? No, you know what? I'm not going to ask what's in the phase. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. It's in that phase that they learn this ratchet form of anti-morality and anti-intelligence and anti-intellectualism. It's cool to be bad, evil, and stupid. And it's in this phase that they develop the bad habits they will take with them into their newly pitifully reformed lives if they decide to repent, even though they mean well when they decide it. They will miss the opportunity afforded by the teen years to develop habits of implementing the morality that they are now capable of understanding as well as any six-year-old adult can understand it. And instead, they're going to develop laziness, cheating, lying, and other trifling habits they will carry into the 20s and into their attempts to reform. One example, and you can always tell this, they don't learn to read or write or punctuate correctly in their English and language arts classes in the teen years because that's not cool because they're teenagers and they're allowed to go through that nigga teenage phase by us. So when they get older and decide they wanna be woke, you see them post on FB, Twitter, trying to type these woke posts or maybe some Christian and inspirational posts, but they're quoting and misquoting Tupac, the pastor, Jeeves and Snoop Dogg, who also went through this nigga phase and became Snoop Lion, a, a Rastafarian prophet, as he says Louis Farrakhan told him he was. And not only quoting and misquoting them with nigger wisdom, but can't spell or punctuate it in their own first language either. So when you see this on FB or Twitter or even Black Junction, you know this nigger dissed and refused good advice while in the teens and decided to go through the nigger teen phase anyway. 
and then picked up these habits. This leads to how we can distinguish between a jigaboo ass nigga that had to go through it because he or she wasn't mature enough to bypass it and the mature individuals who decided to bypass this nigga teenage phase as much as possible and try to put some morality in their decisions. We can tell who's who by these signs and these habits. And this is why the ones who grew up pro-black, like my parents raised me and my brother, made decisions early in life from a real pro-black stance made decisions early in life considering what is going to be best for us and our people thereby growing up to not shout and preach but to live pro-blackness while the ones who had to go through the nigga teenage phase first had to start preaching it when they decided to go into the pro-black phase and not living it because their habits wouldn't let them and in disgrace and embarrass those of us for whom being pro-black is how you truly live so you see these pro-black niggas on YouTube that weren't pro-black when they were young. I don't want to hear about this. I, I found it at 30. No, nigga, when you were young, you should have done it because now these pro-black niggas are beefing on YouTube. But where were these niggas when they were in their teens? Were they pro-black then? And if not, why not? Now they're beefing on YouTube, calling each other out. And pretty much disgracing those of us who grew up pro-black, thinking we'd have some sort of pro-black community to which we could contribute and join. Instead, we find it hijacked by some ex-niggas on social media. It doesn't matter if you decide to be an ex-nigger if you're going to keep acting like a nigger. If not then in the teenage years, even before the teenage years, then why not? Because pro-blackness was a thing back then. If their parents were pro-black, then why did they pick up nigger habits from nigger culture that bleed out in front of us on social media to this day? The answer is the nigger teenage phase. It's not popular and cool to be pro-black or even to be any kind of positive when you're a teenage nigger. And we have, if we have to separate our teens from each other for a generation to get them to bypass this poisonous nigger teenage phase, then separate them and homeschool them from high school on. That's real. Now, let's look at these ex hoes as an example. And this is important because they gave away their most prized possession, as they call it, to the teenage niggas when they were teenagers. And when even these teen niggas were no longer teens, they did it. These hoes are in the teen nigger phase still, as being a hoe is one of the traits of the nigger teenage phase. And this is not only marked by loose sexual behavior, but by the price discrimination we know very well. Putting it on MAC 10, backing it up, raw dog. No protection. Straight cream pie on Mac 12 and his little brother Mac 10 for free. And then pretending to be something else in front of the guy who ain't acting like Mac 12 and Mac 10. Like a stereotypical nigga teen. So that this other guy will treat you better and commit more without sex because he doesn't know you're a slut for lazier guys. Well, they may decide to be ex-hoes one day and they'll listen to someone like Shira 7-1 or Nicole Michelle. Here's where the problem comes in. She receptive one will tell you stuff that will really harm you because she'll have you summoning spirits that you don't know are demons. Some of you get into this occultism stuff and you summon a spirit. You think they're not demons. No, if a spirit will answer you when you summon them, that's a demon. And then you ask them to help you secure a rich man. Guess what? Number one, those demons always extract a price and they will not help you unless you refuse to disbelieve in God. Don't believe me? If you insist on summoning them, then ask them if you can worship Allah and they'll still help you. They'll demand that you choose one or the other. And they might give you one freebie just because they'll, they know I'm telling you this. But they will not help those who refuse to disbelieve in Allah in the last day. Some may even try to harm me for telling you this. Because these, you know, these demons, they do answer. She by 7-1 will mess you up. And I can tell you this because she keeps referring to getting the bag as though she can sell herself. But she won't refer to herself as his property for paying her cost. She doesn't tell you to be submissive in exchange. She does say be feminine in some videos, but she doesn't say be submissive in exchange. Nicole Michelle will tell you to be feminine and submissive to a man who provides and protects. But she won't tell you that not every man is either a broke dusty or a rich and loaded man. She won't tell you that all of them are in these two extremes and many of them are somewhere in the middle. She never points out that broke doesn't mean dusty, first of all. She never tells you that. Or that America systematically impoverishes and underpays black heterosexual men. Or that most men in America are neither very rich nor poor, but that black heterosexual men are the most likely to be poor and stay poor even if their parents weren't. She doesn't explain any of this because she doesn't care. 
She has a high income threshold, and if you're below that income, she refers to you as broke and dusty. She doesn't ever mention to you how you can be feminine, but you can also lower back your standard of living in the beginning so that you can have more of a bag later on in life. She says be feminine but secure the bag. However, she also tells potential ex-hoes that this will work for them. No, it won't. Ladies, understand that if you want the bag, you have to overlook men who ever were niggas and got caught doing nigger stuff because they ain't going to make a lot being ex-cons or even ex-niggers. Because you got to understand, this is still seen as black masculinity. I mean, it's still seen as black machismo and black masculinity or machismo are always penalized. So these ex-niggas that became ex-cons, well, guess what? They're going to get less in life. And you'll know them because they will still write and spell and punctuate like niggas, which means that they can't write and spell and punctuate. And they wouldn't do it if they could because they're embarrassed by literacy in front of other niggas anyway. Ladies, understand that if a man wants a woman with whom it's worth it to share his bag, not lose his bag so she can secure it, but just to share his bag, just share it, she still has to have never been a hoe. Ladies, remember this quote from me, please. You can only be as worthy and as valuable to a future man as he knows you were cheap to any past man. If you gave one nigga the vagina for free and, uh, and he, a future man finds out about it, he's not supposed to give you anything in exchange for it. If a man makes an exception, he better have smutted out as many women as the number of times you got smutted out. End of story. And I wasn't no player back in the day. I wasn't knocking them down like that because I didn't appreciate that when I got the attention and respect from sisters, it was only after I had more fist fights and less time than other black guys my age just to get the same attention and respect as them. So I wasn't going to touch them to knock them down. You heard what I told you about what I went through. And I only have what I guess is 35 percent of a bag. I got no reason to take an ex-ho as a wife or even a serious dating partner if I wasn't already Muslim. I didn't do enough dirt beforehand to justify accepting that. If I found out a woman effed one guy casually, she can't ask for a commitment from me. One guy casually. What do you think men have? What do you think a man who has more to offer is going to tell you? Ladies, understand that ex-hoes can't get out of men what women who are never hoes to begin with can get. And hoes can't get what an ex-ho might get if the future man doesn't know she was a hoe previously. <laughs> Women and men understand that a Johnny come lately conscious nigga, even if he or she is sincere now, can't get what an authentic pro black from youth and with no nigga phase in his or her past can get out of life or out of the real conscious community. <laughs> men understand that if you had to be an idness in your youth, then yes, you can partially put that on black women's selection criteria and you take your share of blame too, but you cannot get access to the same places and some opportunities as a black man who never went through the IDNS phase to begin with because your speech and writing and your so-called swag are going to show that you're not the same as the guy who bypassed that idness crap to start with <laughs> while you went through that phase. We cannot sit up here and let our kids think that they can afford that teenage nigga phase or the, just the white teenage phase they see on TV before they're teens. Don't let them get these ideas in their head before they become teens. They can go through teenage years chronologically, being 13 and being 14 and being 15 up into 19 and 20, but not this Western idea of the teenage phase morally or it will take another generation for the black community to even begin to fix itself. I think I said enough, and I hope that what I said has been a benefit. Blackheart, sign of blackout. Aslam Lakum. Oops, my bad. I forgot to include something else. Sorry about that. One of the things about this nigga teenage phase is that it can be used to answer uh, the colorism argument. And it actually explains why there is a colorism argument to begin with from Jump. And that is this, the nigger teenage phase is when colorism and childhood as well uh, are when colorism is most real in the black community between uh, black boys and girls. And when this colorism uh, happens in youth, in, in, in uh, middle school and high school 
the preteens and the teens. This is when um, many of our girls, maybe even our boys, do become traumatized behind colorism. It almost happened to me, almost. On one hand, I was lucky to not know what the reason was. On the other hand, I was unlucky to not know what the reason was. But um, it happens to the boys and the girls, especially the darkest of our girls and the palest of our boys. Sometimes even the palest of our girls and the darkest of our boys also catch it. But many black folks do go through some form of uh, complexion-based trauma when they're young because we are a community that is hard on both genders and all complexions. Unless you just right in the middle and can't nobody say one or the other about you for whatever reg region you're in. For one, if you're black, you're gonna go through trauma induced by other black people. And this is largely going to happen in childhood and in the teenage nigga phase years. Notice, I don't say the teen years because that doesn't necessitate the teenage nigga phase as I've been saying, <laughs> but this is one of the reasons why, and see, this is, I know a lot of us say, we don't want to hear the colorism argument from the women. Well, you don't want to hear it as an excuse about what's happening as an adult, because as adults past the teenage years, many of us are not colorist. Now, a lot of sisters, a lot of grown sisters are not necessarily colorist uh, in their hatred per se, at least not of, of men, but they may be colorist just in their preference, which is not really colorism anyway. Sisters have the right to like what they like, so long as they're honest about it and not disrespectful. Same with men. But in the, but many of us carry this trauma with us, and a lot of guys are encouraged to not care anymore when they get into their adulthood. So they don't care, but one of the ways that you don't care about trauma when you don't get counseled for it is that you don't remember it. So a lot of brothers really don't remember a lot of what they've gone through. They might remember some of it, but not enough to still feel traumatized because remember when we go through trauma, we don't get counseling for it at any point. We're not a people that seek out counseling and we don't even know that we've been traumatized. We just think we tough. So this is what really happens. No joke, this is what happens when you're black in the Americas. It's not just the United States. No, no, it's in the Americas and in Africa to a certain extent because remember, colonization did a mind job on them. So to a certain extent, this teenage nigger phase um, in which even the children of real pro-blacks and real black conscious people decide to bypass the consciousness and go through the teenage nigga phase leaves you with trauma and you might be able to be an untraumatized person by forgetting large chunks of it as we men are trained to do and if you are a lady you're 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 allowed more so to express trauma and hurt you're allowed more so to talk about it when you're an adult and so you can remember more of it. And this is why we have the debate. We don't need to sit up and tell sisters there's no colorism. We just need to tell them that that's that childhood stuff. That's what we got to do. And also I want to point this out. The colorism that the children learn is not something that adult black males are allowed to pass on in large quantities. It's not allowed Black adult men are not allowed to get away with promoting colorism in younger black folks and black children. It's not tolerated. For one, um, it's not important enough for a lot of black adult men to feel they're going to pass on to their kids. Secondly, if they did it and they got caught, you understand the boo-boo storm that would happen in that immediate area if that was the case. Thirdly, um, other thing that's got to be understood is that sisters have the option to pass it on and oftentimes the children do get it. What is happening is that the men, although most of the men, a few men will, will join the adult women in promoting it, 
most of the men don't say anything one way or another. And this is where we have screwed up as men, because many of us in these communities don't stop and say to the kids, listen, that that stuff is not that do, really doesn't make a difference. Many of us make it into a joke, which is not a bad thing to do. But many of us forget and don't let make the kids understand this is just a joke between us guys. This is just a joke. It is not serious. Ladies, this is a joke. It's not serious. You want to say that light skinned people can't fight? Make sure you understand it's just a joke. In real life, whoever fights enough gets good at it. This is not something that we need um, to just sort of let slide and let go because a lot, of, a lot of adults have said, many adults have said that they primarily learned colorism from the adult women in the family. Okay? So that means it ain't primarily. I don't mean with no exceptions, but it means it's not primarily being taught by the men. However, we men in the communities would do a good job of whenever we have time to talk to the kids, telling them that this is foolishness. You can't pass it on. If your mom or your aunt teaches you this stuff, you have to ignore that lesson because that's not one that's going to help you. But when we have these debates, it's largely because we men, in addition to having forgotten a lot of what traumatized us, we men also were thinking that these women are talking about adulthood. And when the women are talking about colorism, the women, when they're exaggerating it, when they're telling the truth, um, the women are talking about childhood. That's what's going on. It's like I said before. And so we don't need to automatically say no you're making this up you're exaggerating this is not what you went through when uh, you, this is what you this is something you've never gone through we don't need to say that what we do need to say is okay in childhood this probably did happen yeah that was very it was a it's a very high likelihood in childhood to happen to boys or girls but if we're talking about adulthood when are you sure that you went through this in adulthood cuz i'll let you know straight off the bat if it is um, if it is going on in adulthood, it's probably going on in the cases of men who make the most money. Now, it doesn't mean that every black man that makes a bag, a big bag, is colorist. What it does, what I have found, is that almost every black adult male that is colorist has also made a large quantity of money. That's what I have noticed, for the most part. Anytime a man says something that we would perceive as being colorist, they had a ton of money and this can be traumatic for the women. And that's when we step in and say, OK, yeah, OK, that's traumatic. I get it. But it's traumatic because you're materialist, because regular normal brothers ain't saying stuff like this. They're more likely to say that they prefer chocolate, but you don't care because they ain't got that bag. You're still trying to sell yourself to the highest bidder. And if that's what you're going to do, then understand that if you're selling yourself, you're not free anyway. So you fuck the shuck up because you're a property to be owned. That's the argument that we men have failed to make. That's what it comes down to. If you are selling yourself to the highest bidder, then God damn it, you are property. Bought and paid for. We might as well go back to slavery if that's what it's going to be. So anyway, this being said, um, I'm hoping that what I've said to you has been of help to you. Uh, thank you for being patient while I added this little bit on at the end. Blackheart, sign a blackout again. Assalamu alaikum.